Good morning, everyone. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Marja Hurley, Professor of Medicine and Orthopedics at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine and Associate Dean for the Health Career Opportunity Programs at UConn Health. Dr. Hurley received her BA and MD from UConn, followed by a residency in internal medicine and fellowship in endocrinology at UConn as well. Her research focuses on the role of fibroblast growth factor two in osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and phosphate homeostasis. Her lab has made seminal observations on the importance of the FGF2 in maintaining bone mass in mice and was the first to demonstrate that FGF2 expression in bone cells is increased by parathyroid hormone. She has served on several NIH scientific review panels and was elected as the chair of the prestigious International 2018 Gordon Conferences on Fibroblast Growth Factors and Development of Disease. In addition to her research work, Dr. Hurley has made significant contributions in medical education diversity as Associate Dean and Director of the Health Career Opportunity Program at UConn for more than 25 years. During this time, she has fostered the enrollment and career development of students in biomedical science at all levels and substantially increased the number of underrepresented and first-generation students attending UConn schools of medicine and dental medicine. Dr. Hurley has published over 150 peer-reviewed articles and has been the recipient of numerous awards, including UConn's Martin Luther King Award for Achievement in Science and Neeg Medal of Honor and the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research Lawrence G. Ray's esteemed award for outstanding achievement in preclinical translational research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hurley. So I would like to uh, thank you all for coming today and uh, also thank uh, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Bresnan, and, and Dr. Kim for inviting me to uh, uh, to speak uh, about these very intriguing um, uh, isoforms of FGF2 as potential uh, new players in osteoarthropathy. Um, just wanted to acknowledge the funding from NIH and I have no other uh, disclosures. And this is just an outline of my, uh, my presentation. I'll talk a little bit about osteoarthritis and uh, a few words about fibroblast growth factor receptors and the FGF2 ligand. Uh, the FGF2 isoform uh, transgenic mouse model, which was developed in my laboratory. And also uh, a, a few words about X-linked hypophosphatemia. And the knowledge gap that I want to address, which is the uh, relationship of uh, uh, the OA phenotype in XLH and the potential role of FGF2 in modulating FGF23. So the hypothesis, the studies to address the the uh, knowledge gap, uh, results, uh, summary, and conclusion, and potential future uh, directions. So osteoarthritis is a debilitating joint disease that affects around 27 million adults in the U.S., and it's caused by the generation of the articular cartilage. If there are any osteoarth osteoarthritis uh, folks in the audience, I'm not going to be talking much about the bone because I know there's controversy as to what's more important, the cartilage or the bone in OA. Uh, articular cartilage is found at the joint surface of long bones and is vital for joint uh, mobility. And as we know, uh, currently the only effective treatment for osteoarthritis is total joint replacement, which clearly is not a permanent uh, solution. So um, uh, just to review, um, so this is the femur and the tibia, and this is the knee joint. And I just want us to focus for a moment on the uh, articular uh, cartilage. Now, ordinarily, uh, the articular cartilage uh, of the joint is an avascular structure, and the chondrocytes are in an undifferentiated state. But in early stages of osteoarthritis, you have the, cart the, the chondrocytes, um, these cells begin to proliferate, they have increased matrix uh, synthesis, and they also have increased uh, production of, uh, of uh, inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-1. There's also the production of destructive enzymes such as the uh, uh, matrix metalloproteinases and atoms, and I will speak a little bit uh, during the talk about MMP13 in particular. So you have the loss of the normal phenotype. Uh, the cells begin to differentiate, becomes hypertrophic chondrocytes, and you have calcified cartilage. 
You also have changes in the subchondral bone. You have increased bone remodeling. Um, you have sclerosis of the bone. You have thickening of the subchondral plate. And you also have other modifications of the articular cartilage. And in particular, you also have loss of trabeculae as the um, uh, osteoarthritis become uh, more severe. And you can also have sclerosis of the bone. Now, fibroblast growth factor, uh, there are actually 22 ligands. There's actually an FGF 23, and the reason for uh, that is um, FGF 19 and 15 are um, uh, uh, human and mouse uh, homologs. And there are at least four FGF receptors. And these are uh, the FGF, um, several of the ligands, but also FGF 2 in particular, is essential for bone growth and cartilage metabolism. FGF2 is expressed by osteoblasts and also chondrocytes. And we reported almost 20 years ago that deletion of FGF2 in mice leads to decreased bone mass, bone formation, and, um, <coughs> and, mil and mineralization. Now, uh, um, there is a lot of data in the literature about uh, the role of FGF receptors and, uh, and osteoarthritis and uh, in both mouse and in humans. And the literature is very uh, controversial because there are some studies that suggest that FGF uh, uh, and FGF2 um, uh, in particular um, can be either catabolic or anabolic. So if, um, uh, and the studies uh, that support a catabolic effect uh, um, notes that uh, signaling of FGF2 via FGF receptor 1 leads to activation of both the RAS and the BKC pathways, uh, and both uh, resulting in activation of RAF. RAF um, uh, uh, signaling um, increases MEC, uh, ERK, uh, and resulting in, in increased RUNCS2. RUNCS2 is then translocated to the nucleus, where it will affect um, uh, uh, transcription of genes that promote osteoarthritis, such as MMP13, ADAMS5, 4, 5, <coughs> type 10 collagen, and VEGF. Uh, if uh, there is activation of um, the transcription factor ELK1, uh, this results in increase in the degenerative enzyme MMP13. Uh, and um, there are also studies that suggest that FGF2 um, uh, binding and signaling through FGF receptor 3 is, um, is anabolic. Now, studies have shown that if you knock out FGF receptor 1 uh, in mice, and that's a conditional knockout because global knockout of FGF receptor 1 is an embryonic lethal, um, that, you can, that, that is protective against OA. Um, if you knock out FGF receptor 3, there is increased um, uh, uh, evidence of OA. Now, what is not known until our studies uh, was whether or not the, a particular isoform of FGF2 could be contributing to the, uh, you know, uh, this um, uh, uh, indication that FGF2 could be both um, uh, catabolic as well as uh, anabolic. So let me tell you a little bit about this uh, uh, very unusual protein that I've been studying for all these years. So the FGF2 gene is a single copy gene and it encodes for multiple protein isoforms. And these are uh, ubiquitously expressed in many tissues, including osteoblasts. And I must confess that many, many years ago, um, everyone was uh, very surprised that the FGF2 um, knockout mice was not an embryonic lethal because it was so widely expressed, clearly suggesting that one of the other FGFs uh, could, um, uh, could uh, uh, compensate in certain circumstances. Uh, so getting back to uh, the FGF2 gene, um, so th um, there are these four high molecular weight isoforms and a low molecular weight uh, uh, isoform of FGF2. When most people think about FGF2, they think of basic FGF, that's the 18 KDA low molecular weight isoform that everybody throws on cultures and think that that's the end of the story. So what happens here? So this is um, the, uh, the, the, the CD, the, 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 um, uh, cDNA, if you have translation at these uh, CUG codons, you get expression of one of these uh, high molecular weight isoforms. If you have translation from the AUG methionine start codon, you get the low molecular weight um, uh, isoform. 
So, um, about a hundred years ago, I did a sabbatical, the one and only six month sabbatical that I ever took. And um, I came back from the laboratory uh, in California with the cDNAs for these different isoforms. And I was very intrigued by the biological relevance of these isoforms. There were some studies uh, in Europe where there were some individuals who were looking at the isoforms in terms of uh, their potential role in neurologic disorders. But there really wasn't much uh, uh, in, in terms of its biological function. So we used um, the uh, COL 3.6 promoter uh, to drive the expression of the cDNA for uh, GFP sapphire because I wanted to be able to uh, use this for um, you know, some of the tracking studies uh, that we were, were planning to do and to see what tissues um, uh, expressed uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the GFP. And we also used the promoter to drive the cDNA for the high molecular weight isoforms of FGF2 as well as GFP sapphire. Um, if we have some time, I'll show you the data uh, for the low molecular weight isoform uh, using the same strategy. But what we observed was that um, there was um, a, a, a dwarfism in the high molecular weight TG mice, and uh, there was decreased BMD, osteomalacia, and hypophosphatemia. And there was also increased FGF23. Now I must confess that when I first saw this, I was rather upset, because for years I had been going to the ACE-BMR meetings, and no one was interested in FGF2. And suddenly, uh, there's a lot of interest in this mouse because there is increased FGF23. It's not surprising. FGF23 is a major phosphatonin, as uh, we all know. Uh, now, if there are any uh, graduate students or uh, fellows in the laboratory, in, in the audience, uh, someone went up to the uh, mouse house and came back and said that uh, some of the mice were having difficulty uh, walking. And I said, well, what do you mean? So to make a long story short, we took some uh, x-rays and we found uh, that um, some of the mice had really pretty severe osteoarthritis. So if we just spend a little time on this slide, we see um, from the blue arrow that there's some thinning of the subchondral bone, even at two months of age, uh, and that there is some uh, flattening of the tibial plateau. Uh, at eight months, uh, there is evidence that this is more severe and more evidence of thinning of the subchondral bone. Uh, there is also um, beginning of an early uh, osteophyte. And by 18 months of age, the joint is totally destroyed. Uh, we see that uh, there is narrowing of the patello uh, 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 femoral space. Uh, there is also a more uh, evidence of sclerosis of the bone and there's a more prominent osteophyte uh, uh, present. Now, um, uh, our mouse model um, had some of the phenotype uh, uh, that is expressed by individuals with uh, X-linked hypophosphatemic uh, rickets. And, uh, and um, uh, just a little bit about XLH, uh, it is caused by mutations of the PEX gene resulting in abnormal cleavage of FGF23. And exhalate subjects develop OA that can be quite severe enough to warrant joint replacement. The hip mouse, uh, homologue of XLH, also develop OA. And uh, I think one of the uh, reasons why our mouse model was, became of interest to the field was that we showed that the hip mouse overexpressed these high molecular weight FGF2 isoforms in osteocytes. So high molecular weight uh, FGF2 TG mice, phenocopy XLH, and the hip mice with OA, increased FGF23, and increased FGF receptor signaling. So just to uh, put this all together again, uh, repeating some of what I said before, so you have um, a mutation in the PEX gene resulting in abnormal cleavage of FGF23 uh, so that you have an, an accumulation of the, um, uh, the uh, active form of FGF23. This leads to hypophosphatemia because FGF23 binds to its receptor and, and uh, closo on the kidney surface uh, and activates um, the um, 
uh, MAP kinase pathway resulting in decrease uh, in the sodium phosphate transporter, NPT2A, uh, and, uh, and phosphate wasting. Uh, the, there's also increased FGF23 in bone and blood and increased FGF receptor signaling. And the phenotype that one sees are the dwarfism, osteomalacia, anthesopathy, which I'll not speak about today, and the osteoarthritis, um, which is the focus of the presentation. In terms of what we have published and, our, and uh, some of what we published was uh, confirmed by Daryl Corl's group, uh, we, we showed that the high molecular weight FGF2 transcriptionally regulates FGF23. There's still a lot of work to be done, but uh, at least we uh, are pretty confident about uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, observation which we published in, uh, in JBC. So, um, so a little bit uh, more about the rationale for our studies. Um, there is very limited data on uh, FGF23 in osteoarthritis. There was a paper that I found um, uh, where um, uh, Gilbert showed that FGF23 promotes terminal differentiation of chondrogenic um, cell line ATDC5. And we published that increased FGF23 and wind signaling contributes to the OA phenotype in the high molecular weight TG mice. Um, uh, furthermore, the FGF receptor inhibitor, BGJ398, which is in, u in clinical use for the treatment of certain cancers, was shown to ameliorate FGF23 mediated hypophosphatemic rickets in the hype mice, and we published um, uh, in that uh, it also ameliorated um, these phenotypes in our high molecular weight TG mice. So the knowledge gap is, is the effect of FGF receptor blockade on OA, um, uh, is there, there's no data on that, so we wish to um, address, uh, um, uh, address that. So we posit that aberrant FGF receptor signaling contributes to OA observed in the high molecular weight TG mice. And our goals were to examine whether OA can be rescued with a FGF receptor inhibitor, BGJ398, and we also wanted to assess whether FGF receptor blockade modulates increased canonical wind signaling observed in the OE knee joints of our, of our high molecular weight TG mice. So this is just, um, so, um, so uh, we proposed to do two things. We wanted to see if um, early um, uh, treatment uh, of these mice could um, prevent or or delay the, um, the OA phenotype. And in later studies, which I'm not showing today because we actually haven't done them as yet, another question was if you were to, um, to treat uh, the mice after there was some evidence of OA, but not total joint destruction, could you actually affect uh, the development? So what I'm showing you now is that uh, we're taking uh, windling mice and we're treating them with either vehicle or BGJ398. BGJ398 was developed by Novartis, and this was a gift uh, from them to me. Uh, so the mice uh, were treated um, sub-Q daily for nine weeks, and uh, uh, they were sacrificed, um, and we uh, 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 did um, X-ray, micro-CT, histology, and qPCR. Um, we've done these studies, um, independent studies, in both uh, male and female mice. Uh, so, um, and so this uh, shows that uh, if you look at the high molecular weight vehicle mice and you compare uh, the joint space, you can see that there's some narrowing of the joint space compared with the, uh, the, the vector uh, vehicle treated mice. And you can see that uh, treatment with BGJ seems to uh, rescue some of uh, the narrowing and also the flattening uh, uh, that we uh, observed. By micro CT, you can see that there is um, erosion in the sub on the surface of the, sub of the uh, articular cartilage, and that was nicely rescued um, by uh, the uh, BGJ treatment. Um, uh, we also, um, if you look more uh, closely at the, uh, the subchondral bone of the epiphyses, you can see that there's a loss of trabeculae 
compared with um, the vector mouse. Uh, you can also see that there's thinning of the, um, uh, the, the uh, articular um, uh, surface of, of the bone. And treatment with uh, BGJ uh, seems to um, rescue a lot of that phenotype. And by um, and um, uh, micro CT analysis shows that there was a decrease in bone volume, trabecular volume, uh, which was rescued, and also a decrease in tra trabecular thickness that was also um, uh, uh, rescued. Now, if we turn to look at the um, the uh, uh, surface of the the the, the, uh, the cart cartilage surface and. Uh, Safranin O um, is a stain for the proteoglycan. You can see nice staining um, uh, in the vector, and there's really no effect of the BGJ in this situation. You can see that there is a, um, a decrease in proteoglycan in the high molecular weight vehicle treated, and there is uh, some uh, a rescue um, by BGJ. And, and, if, um, and also, a marker of that this, uh, the articular cartilage is becoming more uh, bone-like, you see that there is marked uh, increase in alkaline phosphatase uh, staining on the surface, uh, and uh, this is decreased uh, with the BGJ treatment. We measured articular cartilage thickness. You can see a significant decrease compared with the uh, vector, and there was um, a significant rescue um, by, um, by BGJ. We also looked at uh, the transcription fa factor SOX9 and also the um, uh, MMP13. You can see that there is um, increased uh, staining for SOX9 in the high molecular weight vehicle, and this is reduced by BGJ treatment. And when we quantitate uh, the positive staining, there is a significant increase in the high molecular weight vehicle treated, and BGJ uh, rescues that quite nicely. Uh, similarly, uh, staining for MMP13 is increased in the high molecular weight vehicle compared with the vector vehicle mouse, and again, nicely reduced um, by uh, BGJ treatment. Quantitation of the staining, you see a significant increase and a marked reduction um, by BGJ. We, we, uh, I also mentioned earlier that type 10 collagen, which, are which is a marker of the hypertrophic chondrocyte, and so we looked at the messenger RNA for col 10 that was significantly increased. This is in the whole joint, knee joint now, uh, and this was uh, reduced by uh, BGJ. MMP13 was also significantly uh, increased and was reduced um, uh, by, um, by BGJ. Now, um, we looked at FGF23 because I mentioned earlier that there at least that one paper that suggested that uh, chondrocytes could express FGF23. You see a lot of uh, staining for FGF23 in the uh, chondrocytes, and this was reduced um, by BGJ treatment. Um, and um, there is, I don't know if this is showing as well, but there is FGF23 staining in the osteocytes in the subchondral bone, and that really was not affected um, by BGJ. When we quantitated, uh, we see that um, there's positive staining for FGF23 in the articular cartilage. This was reduced by BGJ. We also measured serum FGF23 because FGF23 is an endocrine hormone produced by the osteocytes and circulates in the blood, and there was increased, and this was reduced by BGJ. Interestingly, however, the staining for FGF23 in the subchondral bone was increased and was not affected um, by BGJ uh, treatment. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, uh, uh, activated FGF receptor 1 uh, has been reported to be very important in the OA phenotype. And we see that this is the phosphorylated or active form of the receptor, and we can see a lot of staining uh, in the high molecular weight vehicle compared uh, with the vector mouse, and this was reduced by the BGJ treatment. Uh, quantitation shows a significant increase in phosphorylated um, uh, FGFR1 and uh, reduction uh, by BGJ. Uh, we did not see um, any uh, major um, differences 
um, in the phosphorylated form of FGF receptor 3, which is supposed to be the protective form. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and also, um, this, is, this is shown in the, in the quantitation uh, uh, data. So um, I adapted uh, this um, a slide uh, that was published by, by, uh, in a review by Zong et al, where they show that in hypertrophic chondrocytes um, that you have multiple signaling pathways that are involved in, in uh, contribute to the OA phenotype. BMP2, uh, wind signaling, FGF, uh, interleukin-1, hypoxia, uh, Indian hedgehog. And they all, um, so for the BMP2 converges on SMAD, um, I'm going to focus on uh, the wind signaling pathway um, in part because of our data showing that uh, modulation of wind signaling could rescue the, the hypophosphatemic rickets and I wondered whether or not it could also affect um, the, um, uh, some of the OA phenotype. So what we proposed was that high molecular weight FGF2 increase FGF23, FGF receptor 1 signaling, and this results in a decrease in the WINT inhibitor uh, DKK1 and SOST, and uh, results in increased um, activation of WINT signaling. Now, uh, this is kind of a, uh, you know, a, a brief the, uh, uh, overview of what the WINT signaling pathway looks like, but we know that the WINT ligand will bind to frizzled and other um, uh, uh, um, receptors on the surface of the cells. Um, will affect um, uh, uh, downstream signaling pathways in colon GSK3 beta. Uh, axin and APC forms a complex. Um, uh, uh, when this complex uh, is uh, altered, you have um, the phosphorylated form of beta catenine being translocated to the nucleus to bind to TCF-LAF and then to affect um, uh, uh, transcription of multiple genes, uh, in particular RONCS2, which leads to um, activation of VEGF, um, MMP13 type 10 collagen, Indian hedgehog, to name a few. So, um, <clears throat> so to, <clears throat> to test whether or not our hypothesis was correct, we looked at DKK1, <clears throat> and you can see that the staining for DKK1 <clears throat> was decreased in the high molecular weight vehicle compared with the vector vehicle or with the uh, BGJ treated. And um, a treatment with BGJ uh, uh, increased um, uh, DKK1. And the quantitation of this uh, in the articular cartilage, a significant reduction and an increase um, by, um, <clears throat> by BGJ. Similarly, uh, we looked at uh, uh, SOST, and interestingly, uh, uh, SOST, uh, sclerostin, was not increased in the articular cartilage. It was increased in the subchondral bone of the, uh, of the vector uh, mouse, uh, and it was decreased uh, in the um, subchondral bone osteocytes um, in the high molecular vehicle, and BGJ uh, increased uh, this expression. Axin 2 uh, was markedly increased uh, in the high molecular weight vehicle and was reduced by BGJ. And the quantitation shown here, uh, marked reduction in SOST in the subchondral bone and a marked increase um, uh, following BGJ treatment. Axin 2 was significantly increased and was reduced uh, by BGJ. We also looked at uh, uh, WIND7B because that has also been reported to be one of the ligands that appear to be important in osteoarthritis. Uh, we see that there was a marked increase in WIND7B and a reduction by BGJ. Quantitation of that, significant increase uh, and reduction, significant reduction by BGJ. And, and uh, the, um, L the LRP5 in particular has been uh, associated with OA, and we see an increase in uh, uh, LRP5, phosphorylated form, the active form, and a reduction uh, by, um, by BGJ. Uh, and the quantitation is shown uh, here. We also looked at GSK3 beta, and that was markedly increased uh, in the articular uh, cartilage and reduced by BGJ. 
and of course active beta-catenin. Beta-catenin was markedly increased and uh, was reduced uh, by BGJ. So uh, summary of the first part of the talk, uh, increased FGF23 and FGF receptor 1 expression in articular cartilage of the high molecular ETG compared to vector. And FGF receptor inhibitor BGJ uh, partially rescued the OA phenotype uh, in the high molecular ETG mice. BGJ398 blocked increased canonical wind signaling in knee joints of the high molecular and TG wise. And high molecular FGF2 contributes to OA in mice via altered FGF23, FGF receptor, and uh, wind signaling. So uh, I've talked about the receptor and I've also talked a bit about the, um, the FGF23. So, we asked uh, whether or not the um, uh, FGF23 neutralizing antibody could also affect uh, osteoarthritis uh, in our mouse model. And the rationale for these studies, again, I've already mentioned that FGF23 promotes terminal differentiation of these chondrogenic cell line. Uh, high molecular weight FGF2 regulates uh, FGF23 uh, gene transcription. Uh, resulting in increased FGF23 in osteocytes in the circulation. Uh, neutralizing FGF23 antibody ameliorated rickets, osteomalacia, hypophosphatemia in the hype mouse and also in human subjects with XLH. And as uh, many of you know, um, uh, uh, the FGF23 neutralizing antibody burosumab was FDA approved uh, uh, to treat um, uh, osteomalacia in adults uh, with uh, rickets and the insomnia group at Yale um, and others, there's a vast uh, number of people involved, showed that um, uh, uh, in a phase three single arm international trial that really uh, affected um, uh, uh, osteomalacia um, uh, uh, quite therapeutic. There is um, a, um, if you go to um, uh, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, there is a, a trial now where that study will end in 2022 and uh, they will be looking at the effects of um, verosimab um, uh, in, uh, on osteoarthritis and on the anastopathy. But currently there's no published data on the efficacy of verosimab in OA of XLH. So we posit that increased FGF23 production contributes to OA observed in the high molecular ETG mice. And we wanted to examine whether OA uh, in these mice can be rescued with an FGF23 neutralizing antibody. Now our antibody is not uh, burosumab. We, ob we obtained uh, this antibody um, as a gift from uh, Amgen. And for the studies, we used 21-day-old mice again, and they were treated with um, either IgG or with um, the, um, the FGF23 um, antibody um, uh, for um, uh, two times a week for six weeks, and we did the usual X-ray, micro-CT, histology, and qPCR studies. Uh, so uh, uh, if we just focus on the vehicle-treated high molecular TG mice again, we see that there is a lot of loss of trabeculae. Uh, we see that there is uh, erosion of the articular surface. And we see that with the um, uh, antibody uh, treatment that there is a rescue of a lot of the, um, of the uh, uh, abnormalities. This is just a little bit more uh, detailed. Uh, uh, th this is just this part of the, the uh, these these pictures are focused on the um, the uh, uh, the rickets, and you can see that uh, uh, in the high molecular TG mice they have uh, the rickettic uh, phenotype, and that's uh, rescued um, by um, BGJ treatment. Um, excuse me, by the FGF23 antibody. And uh, again, uh, we see that the antibody uh, is, uh, 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 rescues the phenotype so that it looks um, more like uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the vector mice. And this is just a, qu a lot of quantitation of the data by, by micro-CT. Uh, but since the talk is focused on the osteoarthritis, we looked at the joints of these mice. We can see that there was an increase in cold 10 and that was um, uh, reduced. MMP13 uh, was increased and was reduced. Interestingly, however, MMP13 
was increased in the vector mice uh, treated with the FGF23 antibodies. So that's something to, for us to, to, to keep in mind. If one looks at the, um, uh, the uh, uh, high molecular TG mice, uh, we see again the loss of the, um, the proteoglycan and reduced reduction in the articular cartilage. And we see that the FGF23 antibody nicely rescues that. Here uh, we're showing a marked increase in the uh, MMP13 um, uh, uh, reduced by the FGF23 neutralizing antibody. Similar, MMP19 was markedly increased, and this was reduced by, um, by, uh, by the uh, antibody. So the summary and conclusion, the high and low molecular weight FGF2 isoforms play different roles in OA, the high molecular weight being catabolic. The mechanism by which FGF receptor FGF23 adversely affects cartilage homeostasis was identified as modulation of the canonical wind signaling pathway. And in the high molecular weight TG XLH model, the chondrocyte was determined to, the most, to be the component of the joint that was primarily responsible uh, for the um, uh, OA phenotype. So the potential significance uh, of the work is that uh, these are therapeutic approaches that partially rescued OA in vivo in mice using an FGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor or the FGF23 neutralizing antibody are novel findings. Uh, there are currently no published disease modifying drugs to treat degenerative joint disease of XLH subjects. And I want to be clear, I'm not trying to say that this is relevant to all of osteoarthritis. If it were, that would be great. But right now, at least the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, osteoarthropathy that we see in the XLH subjects uh, uh, seems, uh, you know, uh, I suspect that um, when the, um, uh, the clinical trial that Carl and Sonny and Tom Carpenter are, are conducting, I suspect that they will have some uh, data to suggest um, the efficacy of the FGF23 um, burosumab that they are, are testing. So some of the, um, uh, the future directions uh, 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 for our work and potential translational questions that I would like to ask is, what happens to FGF2 isoform protein expression in humans uh, with OA, with age, or following trauma? Is there an imbalance in the ratio of the low molecular weight versus the high molecular weight FGF2? Are there changes in FGF receptor expression signaling in OA so that low molecular weight FGF2 plus FGF receptor 3 uh, results in anabolism and high molecular weight FGF2 plus FGF receptor 1 equals catabolism? So uh, one of my long-term um, collaborator, Tom Deutschman, Tom just made um, uh, an F, uh, a high molecular weight isoform conditional knockout mice and it just came into the lab and I'm going to be very excited to see what the phenotype is and really to determine whether or not uh, this is really el um, relevant. I should also point out that you, one could say that this is an overexpression model. Well, we also have mice in which the high molecular weight isoforms of FGF2 were selectively knocked out. So they're only expressing low molecular weight FGF2. We've aged those mice out to almost 20 months, and they seem to be protected against developing OA. Converse, if you knock out the low molecular weight isoform and the mice are just expressing the high molecular weight isoforms, those mice develop OA. So it's not just in this transgenic mouse model that we're seeing uh, 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 this, uh, this phenotype. I wanted to just acknowledge some of the people in my lab uh, uh, Dr. Zhao, who was a fellow with me and is now a faculty member at UConn, uh, she did the work on the, um, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, rickets osteomalacia. Uh, Danielle, who will be starting medical school at UConn in the fall, he's working on the uh, uh, enthesopathy. And um, uh, patients uh, who just completed her PhD in my lab uh, received the ASBMR Young Investigator Award for the osteoarthritis uh, work. And this is where I was in Hope Sound just before I came here. <laughs> and uh, I would to answer uh, any questions that you may have. I'll leave this up so we can all take a look at this. Yeah. <laughs>
questions for Dr. Hurley? So question on the, the SOX9, I mean, is it uh, well known that it may directly uh, damage articular cartilage? So, so it's interesting because SOX9 is usually a marker of the uh, resting uh, chondrocytes. So, when, so the, the increase initially may be an attempt at uh, uh, re reparation and not a causative effect. And that's one of the questions that's been raised, uh, at least in my mind, about FGF2. Um, you know, uh, because we, we don't know, when they say FGF2 is increased, there's no data on which isoform. And so um, is it that, uh, uh, you know, initially if you see an increase, uh, is it because they're in the joint? Uh, is it because it's trying to repair, or is it the cause of the, the, the damage? That's still not known. So it seems to me that uh, you, if you're increasing the amount of cartilage being made, you want to get enough to be beneficial. But if you make too much cartilage, that'll destroy the mechanics of the joint. How do you monitor these mice in order to get just the right amount? Uh, so that's a very good question. And, y you know, uh, we need to do additional studies to see um, if you treat for a longer period of time, if just what you are proposing happens. But at least uh, in terms of the length of the study that we have done, uh, we've, we clearly have not seen that. But that's clearly a very important question. And then I guess, uh, but I, I'm just wondering about the, ad, are there adverse effects for, with chronic treatment with the, the monoclonal antibody, which might give a clue as to what kinds of um, off-target or side effects there might be? So uh, again, I, I think, you know, the, the antibody that I'm using, uh, I guess maybe because uh, burosumab was approved, uh, um, those, are, those, are, those are, are, are studies and questions that the clinical trials will have to answer, and, um, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure we'll be getting uh, that data. Uh, yeah. Another question back. Is, uh, is the problem in these mice only in the knee, because that's all you showed? Certainly in humans, osteoarthritis affects lots of different joints. Yes, and, uh, and so we've collected all of the other tissues, but we haven't analyzed those as yet. But you're right, good point. This is what we focused on initially, but we do intend to look in, you know, the intervertebral disc and other joints as well um, uh, to see. But we don't have that data as yet. Question? Dr. Hurley, I was wondering if you looked at um, osteocontin, whether it's a mount or it's the level of phosphorylation, since it's common in OA progression and also in the Elevated the the FGF23. Yeah, so we have not looked at that as yet. Uh, we plan to do that. We haven't. Good point. Yeah. Other questions? Well, thanks so much, Dr. Hogan. Yeah, thank you.